That is such a happy looking bunch of people. That really brightens my day. Morning had just broken in my own house. The sun was peeking over the horizon of the higher homes arranged around my own, and sunlight was starting to bathe my home in the warmth I'd missed over the past few days of rain as I was watching the festivities of the inauguration unfold on my television. And then my phone vibrated and I looked at the message. Someone took the Black Lives Matter banner again. And I sighed and I nodded. I knew there was another one in my trunk because I buy these things in bulk now, friends. And I had taken the day off for the inauguration and to deal with some plumbing issues at my home and also to get an eye exam, you understand. But this was important, that the sign was going to be up for Inauguration Day. So I went to my neighborhood hardware store over there on Wailai. And part of the process for hanging these signs, you need, hang on, you need these enormous zip ties. That's what holds the sign on. And then there are these little bungee cords that you have to have, and then some tent pegs that you hammer in. And those zip ties hold the top of the sign while the bungees tie the bottom to the tent pegs that are hammered into the ground. And I knew the inventory that we had at the church, so all I needed were these zip ties. Now the cashier has seen me <laughs> over the last six months coming in for various arrangements of these little pieces. And this time she just looked at the zip ties and she said, man, what are you using these for? And I said very matter of fact, factly, Someone keeps taking down the sign we have up at our church, and I need these to replace it. So kind of wordlessly nodding, she finished the transaction and slid them back my way. And I went to the church and collected everything I needed, my zip ties, my bungees, my tent pegs. And actually, this time I needed some spray paint solvent, because someone tried to use some spray paint on the sign, I think, to black out one of the words, and it got on the red tiles of our rainbow flag celebrating our siblings in the LGBTQIA plus community. So I lay all the pieces on this moist grass, feeling the gentle spray of the blessing rains, and I gently cleaned the paint from the sign, and then I put up our sixth Black Lives Matter banner, piece by piece, hammer swing by hammer swing, blessing by blessing. And at last I uttered that old Latin phrase, not unlike the one we heard today in the reading, in a final blessing fitting the sacred occasion, nil carborundum illegitimi, which translates loosely into English as, don't let the bastards grind you down. See, friends, things fall apart. The poem that Martina offered today tells us this. The second coming was written, as we heard by Yeats at the end of World War I, at the beginning of the War of Irish Independence, as we heard as a flu epidemic was scattering the globe. Yeats shares his apocalyptic vision of a breaking morning, the second coming, a new birth of a beast that might reshape and challenge the world. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold, is the line that stands out for many from this work. And it is this line that so well defines our theme for the month of January, brokenness. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Now, one way to hear this line is that there are things, those things out there, material things like signs or other pieces, they break and fall apart. And then we've certainly seen that over the past few weeks over the past few years. In fact, an independent firm that tracks media usage said that the first half of 2016 saw the highest uptick in quotes of this line of the poem ever. Something about that time in 2016 when it seemed that so many of the norms, so many we were used to, all seemed to be breaking down. And then over the past years, those norms just kept breaking for so many until some of the bedrock principles that define our civil society came under attack from within, with the seeming inability to agree or find a center ground, and under attack from outside with a virus and a response to that virus 
further dividing people along lines that many thought we'd never have to consider at all. Whether to wear a mask, whether to be vaccinated, whether to follow the advice of doctors. And the idea that these are now contentious issues open for lively debate may seem shocking to some, but not to all. In the past months, the election and its aftermath in a nation's capital coalesce together to tell us for certain things fall apart. The center cannot hold. But there's another way to hear this famous line. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. The meaning here is that the things fall down. Things cannot stand anymore when they are apart from others. This makes the second part of the line make a little bit of a different kind of sense. The center cannot hold. The center cannot hold things together when the things being held are scattered, divided, or gone. When those things are apart, lacking a center to hold them, they fall. I touched on this some last week, that the intensity of the polarization in so much of our civil society for so long has forced many into the center to go either silent or to just disengage. We are in an era, friends, of the common term now is virtue signals, litmus tests, and we labor in so many of our daily actions under the possibility of being canceled if our views seem not to be aligned with those around us. And as a faith movement, we have a role in this too. Make no mistake about it, Unitarian Universalism is a kind of brand in religious circles. And all of the jokes about our little brand of faith, our little band or brand, basically boil down to this. Think about a position about as far left as you can get. Then the UUs will be farther left than you. They make you feel bad about not being where they are. Many, many of you are faith as a place where even the center ground doesn't really exist anymore. And I'm not, I'm just gonna be a little real with you, friends. This tendency is really, really on display, even more so since we've been apart from one another physically and gathering virtually here, because on Sundays before virtual services, like happened today, when we're all chatting and the discussion turns political, I've noticed an assumption that all those in this space, for all those who'd be at a UU worship service, view politics or the affairs of the world in a similar way, with a similar political brand. And friends, this may shock you, I happen to know that there are folks who voted for the previous administration who come to our services, have been in attendance, and plenty of people who did not want or support the winner of this presidential election. So in the first moments of worship, sometimes in my head, knowing all these things, I feel like when I'm ringing this bell that I'm supposed to be ringing to start worship, it's really ringing it to send the fighters back to their corners when it's supposed to call us together. Does it startle you a little bit to hear that, maybe? Or surprise you? If so, listen up, friends. It shouldn't surprise us. Difference is one of the strengths of our faith, drawing people of all kinds to a free and open faith. In some ways, I see this difference as the future of our faith. See, there's little doubt that Unitarian Universalist communities have staked out some of the most open and affirming ways of being together, ways of worshiping together, ways of learning together, ways of building community together. And many in our communities feel that everybody should be part of a UU community, everybody. And then the world would be a little better. UU churches do play the role of being a place of open and free exchanges of ideas in communities around this country. Places where ideas are met with curiosity and engagement, where learning and inquiry are encouraged and rewarded, and where deepening our spiritual understanding of the world around us is at the heart of what we do. I think the work that Adore is doing has done in both our community and in the wider community is just one of the many testaments 
to that and to its facilitators. And I think that in our hearts, that what many of us want, that is what many of us want. But the question of whether we will accept others only if they believe like we believe, or whether our faith is one that can move wider, accept even more views that might be different from many of our own, that is the challenge. That is the question. Frankly, that is the fight that many of us face. When that bell rings to start the match, I mean to start worship. And part of this fight facing our faith as we move forward is that so much emphasis has grown up now around one's own individual lived experience. So that even the free and responsible search for truth and meaning, our fourth principle, seems at times for me, and I do this, to be seen through the lens of the individual as we have that lens on the world. A friend of mine recently mentioned casually that I, I generalize a lot. And I had to think about that. I reflected on the way I often begin sentences with, in my experience, which keeps the focus on me, but then I sometimes pop off about whatever I might have witnessed or taken part in as somehow now being universal or a shared experience. Sure, there might be some truth to the statement. It's something I've seen or experienced and maybe believe to be true. For instance, like this. In my experience, people who don't want the Buffalo Bills to win the Super Bowl are mean, nasty people with no hope for redemption in this life or the next. Simple like that. But that's just one example off the top of my head. It's coming from my own experience. And I'm generalizing about the awful people in the world. So, but let's go Buffalo. Now, can we all see the flaw in using a personal self-focused lens like this? Wider problems, deeper questions, facing not only us, but those with whom we share this world are aided little by one person's experience alone. In widening the circle of concern, the report from the UU Commission on Institutional Change the commissioners summarize some of the history of the UU movement like this. An overemphasis on individual exploration and experience as the primary, if not the sole, center of religious experience developed. This centering of the individual decenters the communal as the locus of theological exploration. One of the unintended consequences has been the atomized individualism of the search for truth and meaning without accountability to its impact in communities." End quote. These are signs, there are signs, that this trend actually for individuality is reversing to some extent, and they're recent. I think political and social experiences over the past years that have made many realize how much we need to focus on what unites us and not what separates us has been coming. And we cannot forget that there is a public health crisis that has shown us painfully and tragically how connected all humans really are to one another. But we must keep this trend going because things fall apart when the center cannot hold. Even in this passage from the report, we hear this. The centering of the individual decenters the communal, as a locus for theological exploration. I know, I know you're all just waiting for me to finally come out as a big old communist and to embrace my inner Marx and start a vegan commune somewhere where rescued animals can wander freely in and out of my yurt and we can all sing campfire songs about being spiritually superior to everyone else. These are just some of my dreams. But all this passage is suggesting is theological exploration, not certainty. For me, it raises the question of whether I should be starting sentences differently, to notice when I am generalizing and seek a wider view, like this. After listening closely to a lot of people about their experience, it's clear to us, all of us, that people who don't want the Buffalo Bills to win the Super Bowl are mean and nasty people with no hope for redemption in this life or the next. See. It's very different. 
The free and responsible search for truth and meaning is one of the bedrocks of our faith, in part because of what so many experience in other faiths. The sense of that who we are, whom we love, or how we see the world might mean that we are broken or wrong or in need of saving are some of the hurtful messages many who arrive at those doors here in this place virtually have endured. Widening the circle of concern also expresses some of this. This is also from the report. Many of us have come to this faith seeking an alternative faith home and drawn by its actions in the world. Yet we don't often work to heal from our religious past. Those most harmed by the divisive and stressful times we live in are in need of faith tenants that can hold us fast in confusing times and help us make ethical and values-based choices about how to engage. Many of us fought so much of our history and experience to get here. So we need a faith that holds us fast in confusing times. But when we are apart, the center cannot hold. It certainly can't hold the aching and wounded siblings fast in these confusing times. And I want to be really clear. Our community is doing a very good job of this. Our chalice circle groups have been at the center of many of our experiences of sharing what it is in our hearts through these times and showing up for their members with real presence and compassion. The facilitators of our chalice circles are an indispensable piece of what holds this community fast. And friends, as I explained last week, we're growing. We've had a 9% increase in pledging members during the pandemic. It's probably just because we don't have to worry about parking. But certainly, this is a sign of a community that is coming together, owing, of course, in part to the pieces of work that those on the pledge team have been doing through this time. And pieces of this work are getting noticed. Yeah, there are ways that the wider movement of Unitarian Universalism has noticed what this little church is doing. Whether it's me giving presentations about the eighth principle, or even our region noticing us and wanting to speak more about the work that this church has been doing. But even closer to home, our neighbors, in truth, probably just one or two of them. These folks are trying to pull down the very sign, piece by piece, that proclaims a truth that some do not want to see. That the lives of those among us who are treated disparately by systems of the economy for four centuries. Systems of justice for four centuries, of education for four centuries, and of a civil society at large for four centuries are lives that must, that must, that must matter to each one of us. Because when the liberation of black lives comes to be the liberation of all lives, must have come to pass. This is a statement that I hold to so, so deeply. But without all of us, without all the pieces of this work coordinated together, the center will not hold. Without looking wider than the individual experience, the individual analysis, and striving to place our communal existence at the center of our attention, the center of our theological grounding, the center will not hold. Without widening the circle of concern beyond a narrow spectrum of faith, the spectrum of, say, wokeness, the spectrum of values and virtue signaling, we as a movement, we as a people, we as individuals have staked out the center will not hold. Mourning is breaking, friends, and we heard it on Wednesday in a call that reverberated into the hearts of so many, in the lines of perhaps the most celebrated event of the past week, in the lines of the poem that Amanda Gorman gifted the world with revealing, is at the very center of this message. Her words, and every known nook of our nation, 
and every corner called our country. Our people diverse and beautiful will emerge battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade of flame and unafraid. The new dawn balloons as we free it, for there is always light if we only are brave enough to see it, if only we are brave enough to be it. Friends, it won't be easy. All the pieces have to be gathered, to be guided together again once more, and to be held in place with every ounce of our strength until we can unite again and sing a hymn of blessing, to sing a tune of a dawn that breaks over us all, to sing a song that tells the world we won't let the bastards grind us down, and tells the world the faith we have found is a faith worth fighting for, and we are up for the fight. May it ever be so. Blessed be and amen.